So welcome everyone to the Aquarian Almanac series. And this week we will be learning about John of the Cross and Desiree Van Sanden and Maria Garcia. Will, they've done some uh, research and some contemplating on the subject and have thought about it in relation to theosophy. And so it, I'm sure it'll be very, very interesting. And uh, last week we, uh, had a, a presentation on ULT Day. Next week, we will have a presentation. Oh, actually, it's called Novus Ordo Seclarum, which has to do with the newer order of the ages. But we're just going to send out a link to the Institute of World Culture founding day address. And that'll have to do with global leadership. So it's very much um, in the same line of thinking. And after that, uh, next two weeks from now, Gene Jennings will um, lead us in a discussion of spirituality and progress. So I'm sure that will be something very fine as well. So uh, the order is going to be Desiree, then Maria today. So um, as uh, Jonathan stated, uh, Maria and I are going to take, take on this um, take on the assignment of um, basically learning and sharing what we've learned about uh, St. John of the Cross. And um, I'm going to be going into a little bit of his um, history and also some of his literary techniques, which are not new to or original to him. Um, but we're kind of going to take a trip down um, you know, just what kind of literally literal literary styles that he is using, as well as some of the influences in his life. Just thought it might be a good idea before we get into his works that we kind of learn a little bit about the man himself. And then uh, Maria will be following up with a poem that she has selected, a favorite poem of hers that she's going to, I think, read and um, will be asked to sort of meditate on. And so if I, I'm just going to ask everybody to save your cue, uh, your questions or comments until the very end, and we hopefully will have time to do that. Let me put it, did I have it into, um, let's see. Okay. And this is our presentation for today. And so here are some of the key topics we're going to be um, looking at. Uh, first of all, brief background, and I apologize for that it is probably going to be very cursory because we don't have that much time. So I'm just sort of picking out some of the highlights in his life. Um, some of those influences, like I said, the literary, social, theological, and philosophical influences that um, fed into his way of thinking. And some of the literary um, techniques used to convey this idea of connecting soul to divinity or lover to the beloved. It's called bridal mysticism. Um, it's not new. To, he wasn't the one that invented it. It's been around for a very, very long time. Um, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about negative theology, which is a theology of view of divinity through purgation of the senses and spiritual egoism. And finally, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about the Dark Knight, the actual poem, as well as the ascent of Mount Carmel, which is St. John's uh, sort of a curricular treatment of the ascent, which he would have given to the ascetics. And they would have um, expounded on his own personal uh, experiences. And then there'll be some other quotes that we can refer to later on and comparisons with the um, with theosophical teachings. So uh, briefly about his history, he was born in 1542, Juan de Yepes y Alvarez in Old Castile, which is fairly close to Madrid, about 100, uh, 100 miles away. And in 57, he worked as a hospital nurse among advanced cases of syphilis. So he was, um, he did try out other occupations, but he wasn't um, really fit or could do construction very well. He was kind of a unimposing figure. He's small, uh, short, and um, and so it, it kind of matches up with his personality because his personality was very shy. He's a very shy and introverted type. 
1559, he received higher education in Catholic lore and the humanities at the Jesuit College in Medina del Campo. And in 1563, he entered the Camelite Catholic Religious Monastic Order. In 1564 to 1568, he studied theology at the University of Salamanca, and he was ordained a priest in 67 at the ripe old age of 25. In 1568, he joined St. Teresa of Avila, and, um, and together they established a convent of her new discalced or shoeless Carmelite reform movement. And it was different from the, um, the Calcid version, version. The Calcid version was more politically astute and they were more into the organization of the church. Um, these folks, the uh, discalced uh, uh, version uh, were more into um, internal prayer, meditation and austerities. In 1571, he was appointed rector of a discalced Camelite college at the University of Alcala near Madrid. And again, their emphasis here was on austerities, such as fasting, abstention from animal flesh, adherence to life of poverty and solidarity, meditative prayer, study of books and mystical treatises banned by the Inquisition. And on December 2nd, 1577, he was captured by anti-reform Calced Carmelites and incarcerated. And it was during his time in this cell where he actually experienced some of the worst um, humilities. I mean, in one case, he's asked to, in order for him to eat, he was asked to get on the floor and act like a dog and they would throw scraps to him. And, and of course he was tortured and the humility I think was more of a torture than any of the physical abuse he, he received. But he, he, aided by a vision of the Virgin Mary he managed to escape from prison in 1578. And this wouldn't be the first time he'd had experienced a vision uh, of Virgin Mary who assisted him out of um, dire situations. Twice before when he was a child, he had two near drowning experiences. And in each case, he said that the, Mer the Virgin Mary basically saved his life by offering him a way out and um, navigating him through the situation. In 1580, the Vatican granted the discalced Carmelites the right to erect their own province. And in 1593, let's see if I can get in here. In 1593, um, they received independence and recognition of the two groups, the Calcid and the Discalced. And he dies at the age of 49, two years prior to that. So he never really got to see um, their independence. Some of the influences um, at that time, we're talking about a, a time of kind of going back to the classics. Uh, there was medieval Spanish Christian mysticism uh, that was prominent at the time. Uh, St. Augustine and St. Aquinas, for example. Arabic and Sufi poetry uh, really emphasized the romanticism in uh, literary works. And Pseudo Dionysius uh, helped to, uh, was actually associated with that Neoplatonism that also emerged again in this time. Uh, Johannes Meister Eckhart would be another influence. Now these are, these are personalities that of course existed uh, a few hundred years before, 300 years I believe, back in the uh, 13th, 14th centuries. But as everything happens in threes, I'm thinking, you know, you're having this reemergence of these classics. Uh, they're becoming more and more important. Also, what's becoming more important at this time is the return to humanism. So uh, we have a lot of writers at this time that are actually putting out these um, how-to books because what's happening, writers are looking at people and they're observing behavior and they're writing about the behavior that they observe. And when you write about behavior of other people, you're always reflecting on your own behavior. So there's really kind of a, an assessment of what's going on in the human nature at this time. Also going on at this time is the Italian Renaissance, the Spanish Golden Age, and it's happening uh, with the uh, political backdrop of the Spanish Inquisition, which is kind of a dichotomy. And at that time you have the expulsion of Jews and Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula. 
Um, what there's all sorts of reasons for that. The primary one is racism. Anti-Semitism was um, rampant throughout Europe, not just in Spain. Um, but there are also other political reasons as well. I'm not going to get really deep into that. Um, but there were contemporaneous writers at that time that focused on the connection between mysticism and asceticism, as well as other areas. Um, Garcilaso de la Vega, uh, he was a poet that existed at that time, and he wrote commentaries on the South American Andean culture. And this, his books were banned. And I, they were banned, I think, in, in part because he really gave kudos to these um, to the indigenous folks and the way that they practiced. Um, again, his books were banned. Fray Louis de Leon was a poet and translator of classical and biblical works. He was also imprisoned for heretical translations. And St. Teresa de Vila herself was, impri was um, imprisoned for her, not only her works, but also being a part of the um, Discal said reform group. So before we get into any of his works, uh, I want to talk a little bit about bridal mysticism. Bridal mysticism, it was a common religious literary motif in the medieval period for Christian, Muslim, Sufi, and Jewish mystics, as well as Hindu mystics in the East. And we know that going, if we look at the, um, the Hindu pantheon, we have all kinds of male, female representations of not just, and I, I apologize for the noise in my <laughs> condo, but not just representing the connection between the, the lower Manus and higher Manus or the lower and um, higher true self, but also we have these male female figures representing all of the archetype, you know, from the absolute down to manifestation. Um, so this is one way that they used uh, this treatment to represent essential love things as allegories for the soul's love of God and their union. And so on bridal mysticism, and this is in his spiritual canticle, he writes, and this is uh, John of the Cross, the spiritual marriage incomparably greater than the spiritual espousal is a total transformation in the beloved in which each surrenders the entire possession of self to the other with a certain consummation of the union of love. The soul thereby becomes divine becomes God through participation insofar as it is possible in this life. When the spiritual marriage between God and the soul is consummated, there are two natures in one spirit and love. As St. Paul says in making this same comparison, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. This union resembles the union of the light of a star or candle with the light of the sun. For what then sheds light is not the star or the candle, but the sun, which has absorbed the other lights into its own. The soul finds in this state a much greater abundance and fullness of God, a, a more secure and stable peace, and an incomparably more perfect delight than in the spiritual espousal. She lives the life of God. The words of St. Paul are verified in this soul. I live now not I, but Christ lives in me. And here we have the, um, the actual poem. This poem represents uh, John of the Cross in his kind of later stages because there are various um, dark nights that lead up to this um, final dark night, which in and of itself has many stages. And in this state, he writes, one dark night fired with love's urgent longings, ah, the sheer grace. I went out unseen, my house being now all stilled. And when he speaks about his house being now all stilled, he no longer has the vexations that used to hang on him and, and you know, prick at his heels and, and be distracted. He's in his house, even in darkness, he feels secure now. Um, where he once did not. At this moment, all of those vexations have rested. They're at rest. And he writes here, in darkness and secure by the secret ladder, disguised, ah, the sheer grace, in darkness and concealment, 
my house being now all stilled. And so he is, he's speaking about even though he is in this darkness, it's, si it's silent and it's safe. He has no um, interruptions um, from any of his um, lower, I guess, lower um, tendencies. They're all gone at this point. And we can read more on this. Would someone like to uh, read the rest of it? Can I get a volunteer? On that glad night in secret, for no one saw me, nor did I look at anything with no other light or guide than the one that burned in my heart. This guided me more surely than the light of noon to where he was awaiting me, him I knew so well, there in a place where no one appeared. O oh, guiding night, O oh, night more lovely than the dawn, O oh, night that has united the lover with his beloved, transforming the beloved in her lover. Upon my flowering breast, which I kept holy for him alone, there he lay sleeping and I caressing him, there in a breeze from the fanning cedars. When the breeze blew from the turret, as I parted his hair, it wounded my neck with its gentle hand, suspending all my senses. I abandoned and forgot myself, laying my face on my beloved. All things ceased. I went out for myself, leaving my cares, forgotten among the lilies, John of the Cross. Thank you, Truth. Um, and so we can see up here that the soul as a feminine figure is the lover and God, the beloved, is, you know, that is the beloved God. And he's representing this state of ecstasy um, through this um, through this poem. But he goes on to explain this poem in a long, um, in many, many um, essays. And it's called The Ascent of Mount Carmel. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But before we do, it's important that we understand a couple of terms. And one of them is negative, uh, apophatic, and positive, cataphatic theology. So with the negative theology, a form of theological thinking and religious practice, which attempts to reach divinity by negation or privation of material and psychological possession or attachment to power, control, reputation, and material things, or mortifications and appetites. It is associated with mysticism, Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and early Christian writers, and mystic writers too. God is beyond the realm of ordinary perception. And because God is on the realm, the, beyond the realm of ordinary perception, there is an effort upon the ascetic to remove all of those qualities, conditions, and characteristics that are associated with worldly life. But then there's positive or cataphatic theology, which also uses positive things such as virtues, all knowing and good to um, uh, also characterize um, God. But we're gonna uh, focus primarily on the negative. In his biographical essay, Timothy Conway writes about uh, St. John of the Cross. He states that as for the con content of John's prose and poetry, clearly his spiritual method is to leave all known methods, images and forms, and those occasional unusual consolations, uh, visions, loc locutions, perfumes, delights, etc., and to allow that detachment and poverty of selflessness or spiritual purity, which are all one. There are, of course, parallels to this ego death and divine consummation in the world's sacred traditions, most notably the Muslim Sufi, Fane, Annihilation, and Baka, remaining in God and the much more ancient Hindu Vedanta or Neti Neti, not this, not, not this, not this, moksha or liberation from that, from that binds and the unraveling of all knots of the heart so that one spontaneously, egolessly abides as the true divine self or reality or Atman Brahman and all its splendid virtues. And this is none other than the Buddha's nirvana, extinction of the, self, the selfish self-sense, so that only ego-free peace, bliss, compassion, and freedom remain, 
the unborn, undenying awareness, pure spiritual reality, the absolute. I'm going to just quickly go through this. Don't take too much time. And just to uh, do a uh, quick wiki review of what Finet is and Neti Neti, we've got a couple of definitions, courtesy of Wikipedia. And um, let's see if I can read here. Um, in Sufism, it is the passing away or annihilation of the self. Finet means to die before one dies. And some Sufis defining it as the annihilation of the ego before God. Other Sufis interpret it as breaking down the individual ego and a recognition of the fundamental unity of God, creation, and the individual self. And here under Neti Neti uh, reads, um, it is a Sanskrit expression, which means not this, not that, or neither this nor that. It is found in the Upanishads and the Advaita Gita and constitutes an analytical meditation helping a person to understand the nature of the Atman, the self or soul, by negating everything that is not Atman. I'll go to the next. In Elton Hall's um, John of the Cross narrative, he writes that Juan de la Cruz taught that the inner road to mystic union, the spiritual marriage of soul with deity, is beset by two dark periods. The first is the dark night of the senses, the withdrawal of the soul from any attraction to sensory perceptions, and the turning within, which is the true beginning of meditation. This purgation of the body and senses culminates in banishing all discursive thought and mental images. Only then does the soul become filled with the divine light in a spiritual betrothal. This indescribable experience cannot be sustained for spiritual consciousness is not yet wholly pure and lucid. And so it is plunged into noche, noche escura del espíritu, the dark night of the soul. This is the desolation of, the soul, of that soul losing the divine illumination without any wish to return to the tawdry, tawdry lights of the world. And so um, he is, uh, St. John of the Cross, I'll just call him Father John, uh, is actually giving us an, a description of what he's talking about with regard to these uh, purgations. He writes, in the state of perfect perfection, every desire ceases. This perfection consists in voiding and stripping and purifying the soul of every desire. First, it must cast away all strange gods, namely, all strange affections and attachments. Secondly, it must purify itself of the remnants which, de which the desires have left in the soul by means of the dark night of sense whereof we are speaking. Many desire that God cost them no more than words, and even these they say badly. They scarcely desire to do anything for him that might cost them something. They will not even take one step to mortify themselves and lose some of their satisfactions, comforts, and useless desires. Yet, unless they go and search for God, they will not find him, no matter how much they cry or call, cry for him. Seeking God demands a heart naked, strong, and free from all evils and goods, which are not purely God. Even spiritual consolations, if possessed or sought with attachment, are an obstacle. So I want to kind of get into these purgations because um, they're not just a purgation of the senses and then of the spiritual pride. Each one of those um, categories has a subcategory or another category, which is called active and passive. Um, the active, let me see if I can get to that slide. And by the way, I added a third just because I like three. Um, once you get through these um, other purgations, these two other purgations, I would suggest that there's a third, uh, perhaps a purgation of the attachment to even the nirvanic state, which would be the path of the bodhisattva. So here we go, our active and passive purgations. An active purgation, he says, not me, he says, are for beginners in meditation and reasoning. These are the senses of the of objective attachments to things and their pleasure or pain. 
Um, so we're talking about things that are, are obvious. Um, we know when we have an attachment to something because you know, we don't like the way it feels when it's not there. Uh, and he's also talking about on another level, spiritual, um, the detachment from spiritual egoism. Um, so think about one's attachment to, let's say, if you achieve something spiritually, the tendency is to look at yourself and say, hey, I did that, or to contemplate how far along one might be in some sort of um, illusionary um, progression. And he's saying, no, oh, you got to get rid of that too. Once you reach a certain tonation, he says that God itself starts to um, takes starts to take control, and he calls this a passive state. He says this is a state for the proficients in what he terms infused contemplation, leading to the dark night. Infused meaning that it's coming to you now from that place of enlightenment or that state of enlightenment. So it's no longer you in an active state heading toward that light. You've gotten so close. And the only thing I can think to, um, to give an analogy would be is if you got, if that string was vibrating so close to another stronger string, it'll intonate, it'll resonate up to that um, higher, stronger resonation. Um, and he's calling this infused contemplation. The senses here, the purge of the senses here is much more deep and intimate and sublime. Um, so it goes far beyond the apparent or the objective and reaches right into the subconscious. And the spirit is also put through a trial. Uh, it says when the soul feels abandoned, it loses perspective on what it has learned and enjoyed and is incapable of reflection at this point. All egoic memory is lost. Therefore, the soul walks in darkness because this, and not because the darkness is being caused necessarily by the light. It's that when that is compared to um, the darkness that that soul is experiencing, it becomes very dark. Does that make sense? Um, so basically that, that splendor of light comes in and it makes that soul even more uh, aware of how dark it is. I'll read here. Thus the fire of God makes the soul arid as fire to a block of wood dries all moisture from it. He uses this analogy in his um, exposition. He says it's like uh, when fire uh, starts to burn, uh, let's just say a block of wood, um, the first thing it does is it destroys all the uh, moisture that's within that block. And what he says, it's analogous to the divine actually um, preparing the soul for its, uh, by creating this uh, aridity. Uh, so it's preparing it for this um, journey through this dark phase very dark phase. So the ascent of Mount Carmel, as, as stated earlier, is an exposition of this dark night poem. It's meant to prepare the ascetic in his spiritual pursuit of mystical union with God. Um, here in uh, St. John reports details relating to his own experience and he, as he ascends the ladder himself towards this perfect union. Um, and he refers to this in many passages as, um, let's see, as this divine love or dark light it is during this dark night of the soul wherein the ascetic experiences both privations of the senses and of the spirit, first of their outer expression, which we talked about, which is active, and finally of their inner expression, which is passive. And this takes us back to the uh, second verse in the poem where it says in darkness and secure by the secret ladder, disguised the sheer grace in darkness and concealment, my house being now all stilled. Just as a um, trivia note here, Mount Carmel does exist. The Carmelites were originally founded as a community of hermits in Palestine in 1185. Mount Carmel is located in Israel, formerly Palestine near Haifa. And the Carmelites 
though trace their roots and their name to uh, Mount Carmel in the Holy Land there in the 13th century. Where in the 13th century, a band of European men gathered together to live a simple life of prayer. Their first chapel was dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and they called themselves the Brothers of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel. So it's interesting that these, this group, even, even in um, St. John of the Cross's time, really had this very deep um, reverence of the Virgin Mary. So here we go with the ascent, purgation of the senses. He writes, the soul must be pure and simple, neither bounded by nor attached to any particular kind of intelligence, nor modified by any limitation of form, species, and image. As God comes not within any image or form, neither is contained within any particular kind of intelligence. So the soul, in order to reach God, must likewise come within no distinct form or kind of intelligence. So here we're talking about this purgation to get to a point of this passivity. And that there is no form or likeness in God. It's clearly declared uh, by the Holy Spirit in Deuteronomy, where he says, you saw in God no form whatsoever. God is not communicated to the soul by means of any disguise or imagery of vision or similitude or form. Neither can he be so communicated, but in naked and pure essence of God, the spirit that has become perfect, therefore, pays no heed to sense, as it did before when it had not grown spiritually. The soul must remain in darkness, in faith, which is the spirit, and this cannot be comprehended by sense. Here are a couple of poems that he wrote that uh, give us a clue to what he means by negation and purgation. Would anyone like to read um, poem one here? To reach satisfaction in all, desire its possession and nothing. To come to possession in all, desire the possession of nothing. To arrive at being all, to desire to be nothing. To come to the knowledge of all, desire the knowledge of nothing. To come to the pleasure you have not, you must go by the way in which you enjoy not. To come to the knowledge you have not, you must go by the way in which you know not. To come to the possession you have not, you must go by the way in which you possess not. To come by the what you are not, you must go by a way in which you are not. When you turn towards something, you cease to cast yourself upon the all. For to go from all to the all, you must deny yourself of all in all. And when you Come to the possession of the all, you must possess it without wanting anything. Because if you desire to have something in all, your treasure in God is not purely your all. You want me to keep going? Yes. When a soul has advanced so far on the spiritual road as to be lost to all the natural methods of communing with God, when it seeks him no longer by meditation, images, impressions, nor by any other created ways, or representations of sense, but only by rising above them all, in the joyful communion with him by faith and love, then it may be said to have found God of a truth, because it has truly lost itself as to all that is not God, and also as to its own self. Very good. Thank you so much. And here he writes, if a man wishes to be sure of the road he treads on, he must close his eyes. Oh, and what does it say? And walk in the dark. Yeah. Thank you very much for reading that. And more in negation, he writes, since the soul must proceed in its growing knowledge of God by learning that which he is not rather than that which he is. In order to come to him, it must proceed by renouncing and rejecting to the very uttermost everything in its apprehensions that it is possible to renounce whether this be natural or supernatural. Divine union voids its fancy and sweeps it clean from all forms and kinds of knowledge and raises it to, a sup to the supernatural. So um, we've got here some of his essay uh, in relation to the uh, uh, ascension of Mount Carmel. And again, these are many, many, uh, essays or paragraphs versus 
that he's supplied to the ascetic so that they understand what they have in front of them, um, how to basically cleanse themselves of these, um, these vexations and these attachments uh, to reach this dark night. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and read the excerpts. And I know we're, we're probably getting close to, um, John, Jonathan, where are we with time? So it's 4.42 right now, and the meeting goes for, technically it goes to 5.15, but we never, really 5.30. Okay, so I'll read half of it, and then um, maybe if we can have someone read the fragments from the voice and the Bhagavad Gita, that would be great. He writes, uh, it's a happy chance that God should lead it into the night of um, spiritual purgation from which there is from which there is so much good. No man of himself can succeed in void, avoiding himself of all of his desires in order to come to God. And here we have some Christianized um, wording. I know he's gonna talk about the devil and um, he does that throughout. Uh, the devil has power over the soul only when it is attached to things, corporeal and temporal. When the soul is deprived of the pleasure of its desire in all things, it remains as it were unoccupied and in darkness. The darkness of the night, which is nothing else than an emptiness within itself of all things. And does some, would someone care to read the uh, voice and Bhagavad Gita? So voice of the silence, fragment one, withhold thy mind from all external objects, all external sights. Withhold internal images, lest on thy soul light a dark shadow they should cast. And from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 11, the hungry man loses the sight of every other object but the gratification of his appetite. And when he is become acquainted with the Supreme, he loseth all taste for objects of whatever kind. Let a man restraining all these senses, passions, remain in devotion at rest in me, his true self. For he who hath his senses and organs in control possesses spiritual knowledge. Thank you so much, Anthony. In contemplation, God teaches the soul very quietly and secretly without its knowing how, without the sound of words and without the help of any bodily or spiritual faculty, in silence and quietude, in darkness to all sensory and natural things. Some spiritual persons call this contemplation knowing by unknowing, for this knowledge is not produced by the intellect, which works upon the forms, fantasies, and apprehensions of the corporeal faculties. Rather, it is produced in the possible or passive intellect. This possible intellect, without the reception of these forms, etc., receives passively only substantial knowledge, which is divested of images and given without any work or active function of the intellect. Would someone care to read Voice of the Silence here? Uh, voice of the Silence, Fragment 1. He who would hear the voice of Nada, the soundless sound, and comprehend it, he has to learn the nature of dharana, perfect concentration. When he has ceased to hear the many, he may discern the one, the inner sound which kills the outer. Before the soul can remember, sorry, can comprehend and may remember, she must unto the silent speaker be united. Just as the form to which the clay is modeled is first united with the potter's mind. For the soul will hear and will remember, and then to the inner ear will speak the voice of the silence. Thank you, Shoba. It's beautiful. You're welcome. We have, I believe, one more, and then we can move on. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but <clears throat> this is the way the way of unknowing, going beyond all the known faculties, including unusual psychic ones, into a pure faith and imageless, pure and void, contemplative understanding or receptivity, a substantial and loving quiet. 
This is the fertile spiritual darkness or dark night. No thing created or imagined can serve the understanding as a proper means of union with God. If the soul in this life is to attain to union with God and consume directly with him, commune directly with him, it must unite itself with the darkness whereof Solomon spoke, wherein God promised to dwell. Learn to abide attentively and wait lovingly upon God in that state of quiet and to pay no heed either to imagination or to its working. For here, as we say, the faculties are at rest and are working, not actively, but passively, by receiving that which God works in them. And here we have from the, um, uh, the Secret Doctrine. And if someone would like to read that, just kind of as an ending to get our mind around this idea of boundlessness. The Absolute Secret Doctrine, Volume 1. An omnipresent, eternal, boundless, and immutable principle on which all speculation is impossible. Since it transcends the power of human conception and could only be dwarfed by any human expression or similitude. It is beyond the range and reach of thought. In the words of Bandukya, unthinkable and unspeakable. To render these ideas clearer to the general reader, let him set out with the postulate that there is one absolute reality which antecedes all manifested conditioned being. This infinite and eternal cause, dimly formulated in the unconscious and unknowable of current European philosophy, is the rootless root of all that was, is, or ever shall be. It is, of course, devoid of all attributes and is essentially without any relation to manifested finite being. It is beingness rather than being in Sanskrit sight and is beyond all thought or speculation. Thank you, Victoria. And so we have some quotes from other uh, notable individuals. And I'm not going to read these for you, but as I sip on my water, you can read it for a minute and I'll, and I'll um, forward it to the next slide. Just a few more. Alrighty, we've reached the end. So I'm going to stop share. And um, I am ready to hear from Maria. <laughs> I'm going to mute. <laughs> I've spoken enough. <laughs> so today I am going to. Um, go over a poem uh, by St. John of the Cross. And I decided to write the these words in green, transcending all knowledge, because we're gonna see them throughout the poem. It's, it's gonna, they're gonna be the very last words of each verse. Um, okay. So on presentation, um, I will explore the mysticism behind the poem. Uh, the poem is called Stanzas Concerning an Ecstasy, Experiencing High Contemplation. And I'm gonna go over personal commentaries on each stanza uh, of the poem and point to parallels of Christian mysticism and theosophy. And then we're gonna read the poem. Uh, I'm gonna leave you guys with this slide for a little bit while I go over my comments. Uh, so they're kind of like the main idea of each stanza according to my <laughs> observations. So I learned about St. John of the Cross after hearing, um, in a conference, only the introduction to one of his poems. Those words capture my attention. And so I searched and read the entire poem and loved it. I am not an expert in poetry. Therefore, my intent on this presentation will be to point out some aspects that I find that are in alignment with ancient wisdom. I will go over my comments on each stanza and will try to connect them with theosophical ideas. I will set as a basis that ancient wisdom can be found in all cultures 
and the different belief systems. We become aware of that when we begin our search in finding a way that will lead us to the path that can take us back to the one. We then learn that we must turn inward and give our attention to the spiritual aspect in us. We realize that all that is needed is within ourselves and nowhere else. Now, I will read the words of the poem that captivated my attention, which are the door to a mystical ride. I'll read them in Spanish first, because that's how I heard them. It says, Entreme donde no supe y quedeme no sabiendo, toda ciencia trascendiendo. In English, I enter into unknowing and there I remained unknowing, transcending all knowledge. So let's continue with uh, stanza one and entering into the unknown. It can be understood that John of the Cross is trying to describe the beginning of the process when he entered in his innermost self, when he transcended the concrete mind and was suspended in the mere abstraction of everything and nothingness at the same time. Then he describes to the reader that he felt lost in that state of consciousness for a moment, but then realized where his true self was by saying, yet when I saw myself there, his consciousness opened to a more profound knowledge, which led him to understand greater things. That understanding was beyond his rational mind. So he says, even though he was given an understanding, he was left not knowing. In theosophy, it is understood that man has a septenary constitution, the spiritual higher triad, which is Atma, Buddhi, Manas, and the lower quaternary, Kama, Astral, Pranic, and Physical. The mystical experiences are of a higher order and take place in the higher triad, a realm in which the lower self or personality doesn't have access to. Okay, let's move on to stanza number two. Encounter in secret with this perfect knowledge of peace and holiness. He further explains what he was experiencing in that contemplative state. It seems like his soul was having a personal intimate experience in solitude with this other reality, which he calls perfect knowledge of peace and holiness. He describes how it was understood immediately by his soul. I wanna make reference to an article by Robert Crosby, The Language of the Soul, in which he mentions that the teaching of the ancients is that man is a soul. That soul is in fact the one who perceives that it is vision itself, pure and simple, unmodified, not subject to change, and that it looks directly on ideas. This idea presents the fact that the real man in whatever condition he may be exist existing, whether asleep or awake, whether in a physical body during his lifetime or whether in another form of body after death or before birth, or before the existence of this planet or this solar system, that this real man was the same perceiver, then as now the same soul all the time, the creator of all the conditions that have arisen, the intelligent creator of this universe in connection with all the beings below him and all the beings above him. This leads us, leads us to think that the language of the soul seems to arise when the mind is calm and can perceive the vast silence. Okay, let's move to stanza number three. Uh, converging all senses into one in order to have the mystical experience. He describes how he felt so overwhelmed, absorbed and alienated. His soul was not in the physical vehicle. There, therefore, he mentioned how he was deprived of his senses. In the voice of the silence, silence it is mentioned, merge into, into one sense thy senses, if thou would be secure against the foe. This by the sense alone, which lies concealed within the hollow of thy brain and that steep path, which leadeth to thy master may be disclosed before thy soul dims eye. It can be inferred that his reasoning mind and ordinary state of consciousness, which are in charge of decoding the stimuli of the physical senses were turned over inwards so the spirit could take over. In this sense, it seems like the process of thought and the senses converged and became one. Okay, let's move on to stanza four. Recapturing the experience, encouragement to strive for the sublime. 
St. John of the Cross begins to speak in third person, in past tense, and generalizes his experience. For example, he will go on and describe how the person who, take, who makes it to that state of consciousness will free himself from all conditioning. But before this happens, the person might, must give up the idea that he is separate from everything else and that his physical body, personality, and emotions are not his true self. In other words, men must realize that the real in him, the real in him is his soul. And he can only meet with this unlimited power once he strips off that which is impermanent, impermanent in him. And the voice of the silence is mentioned before the mystic power can make of thy a god, a god, Lanu, thou must have gained the faculty to slay thy lunar form at will. The self of master, the self of matter, sorry, and the self of spirit can never meet. One of the twain must disappear. There is no place for both. Okay, in stanza five, finding out that in darkness, the inner light becomes evident. Saint John of the Cross says that the higher a person ascends, the less he understands. It seems that this could be the transition in which the path in front is not visible anymore. So the person must begin to thread his own path and later on become the path, the path himself, which will ultimately merge with the everlasting. The voice of the silence mentions, though cannot travel on the path before thou has become that path itself. Also, he explains that the person who reaches those heights will have less of an understanding and will realize that it was the dark cloud would gradually clear the night. Maybe he is inferring that it is in that void filled with silence in that darkness where the soul find its interior light. Stanza six, realizing that the divine knowledge cannot be understood in its whole fullness. St. John of the Cross mentions that higher knowledge is not known to the wise men. He might be referring to the intellectual men on earth. According to HPB and the Sacred Doctrine, there can be no possible conflict between the teachings of occult and so-called exact science, where the conclusions of the latter are grounded on a substratum of unsaleable fact. It is only when its more ardent exponents over stepping the limits of observed phenomena in order to penetrate into the arcana of being, attempt to wrench the formation of cosmos and its living forces from spirit and attribute all, the blind, all to blind matter that the occultists claim the right to dispute and call in, question their theories. Science cannot, owing to the very nature of things, unveil the mystery of the universe around us. Science can, it is true, collect, classify, and generalize upon phenomena. But the occultist, arguing from admitted metaphysical data, declares the daring, ex the daring explorer who will probe the innermost secret of nature, must transcend the narrow limitations of sense and transfer his consciousness into the region of noumena and the sphere of primal causes. Page 478. I think that explains this stanza. And stanza number seven, giving up oneself to find the true self. It could be understood that when entering into this knowing of the unknowing, a person must have mastered the oneself to be able to have some sort of understanding of that continuous unknowing. As a result, the person will be able to blend with that which is forever transcending. In the voice of the silence, we find, behold, thou hast become the light, thou hast become the sound, thou art thy master and thy God, thou art thyself the object of thy. This could mean that the person has integrated his individuality into the one. And lastly, in stanza eight, becoming aware that divine knowledge is in an eternal constant motion. He reassures the reader that his knowledge in its totality consists of the most elevated sense of the divine essence and that it is due to the, to the mercy of that divine aspect that left the knower unknowing. This can mean that this great knowledge is not contained or limited, that it is in all that exists. Yet each man through manas apprehends or recognizes little by little that in the spiritual core that knowledge is found. 
Lastly, man can only understand portion of this greater knowledge depending on, on his eternal, internal knowledge and the development of his intuition. However, I think that the unknowing is eternally expanding and in continuous motion. Now we will read this beautiful poem. Okay. So the title of the poem is, is called Stanzas Concerning an Ecstasy Experiencing High Contemplation. I enter into unknowing and there I remained unknowing, transcending all knowledge. I enter into unknowing, yet when I saw myself there without knowing where I was, I understood great things. I will not say what I felt, where I remained in unknowing, transcending all knowledge. That perfect knowledge was of peace and holiness, held at no removing profound solitude. Straightway, it was something so secret that I was left stammering, transcending all knowledge. I was so whelmed, so absorbed and withdrawn that my senses were left deprived of all their sensing and my spirit was giving an understanding while not understanding, transcending all knowledge. He who truly arrives there cuts free from himself. All that he knew before now seems worthless and his knowledge so soars that he is left in unknowing, transcending all all knowledge. The higher he ascends, the less he understands. That is the dark cloud which gives clarity to the night. Whoever knows this remains in unknowing, transcending all knowledge. This knowledge in unknowing is so overwhelming that wise men disputing can never overthrow it, for their knowledge does not reach to the understanding of not understanding, transcending all knowledge. And this supreme knowledge is so exalted that no power of men or learning can grasp it. He who masters himself will, with knowledge and unknowing, always be transcending. And if you should want to hear, this highest knowledge lies in the loftiest sense of the divine essence. This is a work of his mercy to leave one without understanding, transcending all knowledge. Okay, so I want to close my presentation with a quote from the Voice of the Silence. And it reads, the more thou dost become at one with it, thy being melted in its being, the more thy salt and unites with that which is, the more thou will become compassion absolute. Thank you so much. <laughs> you so much thank you maria so beautiful very nice my dear thank you <laughs> we have time thank for you. questions comments uh what what it's a question either for desiree or for maria why was it that they were the discalcitos why did they decide to be shoeless? Was it to deprive themselves of something? Uh, was it a form of sacrifice? Uh, what was it? So I, th I think that they were trying to follow a, um, an you know, um, I think what they did was they saw how political religion had become. And these were people who really were raised with uh, internal sense or knowing um, of, well, for instance, he had, ever since he was a little kid, a sense that the Virgin Mary was watching over him. So his um, understanding and his uh, I hate to use the word attachment, but his internal knowing <clears throat> led him down this, this road of, um, of negation, where you're negating everything that's about um, the world, about the flesh, calls it the devil, you know, because he still comes from a Christian faith. But um, 
but he's truly trying to unite himself with the divine. And I don't think that's what organized religion at the time or even today attempts to do. Um, I, I think it attempts in some ways to instill, you know, virtuous acts. Um, but what he was trying to do was actually unite himself with his beloved, uh, which is, and, and all of his, his works revolve around that, um, either expressing his experience trying to do it or, or were poetic expressions of what he was experiencing. So those, um, negate, those purgations were all about um, shedding from himself anything associated with the world in terms of attachments, in terms of desire, in terms of egoism, which, you know, sometimes even spiritually, we have spiritual egoism, which is um, really, really prevalent too, in order to make that connection. So that's why. And does that answer the question? I'm not quite sure. I think it does. I mean, I, I was just thinking uh, this, uh, the part of it, this is probably part of the negation and the mm -hmm. deprivation. Uh, and I was wondering if there was more to it. And possibly there is, um, you know, my studies just <laughs> were pretty limited, um, but because I've only been, I've only picked up the study for like three weeks. So, um, <laughs> but uh, that was the way of the order. So it wasn't just him. That was the way that they functioned way back in what, what, the, what was the year in 1100. 15. And then beyond, <clears throat> their idea was to take religion seriously, that it was something to be contemplated and meditated upon. Um, it wasn't for them a political game. Um, and it was in that, that silence that they found their inner self. You know, and not probably unlike what we do here, you know, we have a commitment to that, that inner self they just have a different way of going about it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a purpose to their negations and, and privations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. May I ask, was it also um, uniting with the divine through mortification? Would it, would yes. it be that as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mortification, poverty. Um, oh. oh, my goodness. Constant prayer. Contemplation. Yeah. Robert had a question. Yeah, I, I wondered uh, what place dialogue. It seemed like you'd spend all your time in silence and meditation. That, that you really wouldn't have a lot to talk about because you you want to get a, to a state of unknowing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is a question. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I'm sure they they did other things. I I know that they said that he could go into such deep trances that he would fall off a horse or forget to read or you know, he would become almost oblivious to whatever he was doing was supposed to do or um, because he was becoming just so disassociated with his flesh, disassociated with whatever happened to be going on at the time. So, yeah, one might ask themselves, um, you know, at what point? I mean, I'm not exactly sure what your, your comment is, but you might ask yourself, you know, how is he um, able to really function in the world and do well in the world, maybe? So I guess that's his primary um, object was to help the nuns and the other monks um, in terms of their, 
progress through up this ladder, this ascension, so that they understood what needed to be shed um, and to be able to identify those um, fallacies within their own selves. The pride, the, I mean, it goes through a, a spiel about all of the, um, what do they call them? The, the seven deadly sins. He goes through all of those and says, you know what? This is how you can identify this deadly sin. This is how you can identify that deadly sin. They exist in all of us um, in terms of spiritual pride. Uh, so many at that time, especially in the Calced group, uh, put more um, emphasis on idols or rosary beads. And he was basically saying that's an external worship. What we're talking about is an internal um, contemplation. And it really makes a difference too between what is meditation and contemplation. He, he it's almost like contemplation um, when you move past simply thinking and you move into this non-passive be or beingness. Um, he calls that that in um, what did it infused contemplation, where the spirit is now starting to take over because you've put down that wall. Now we can get through, but you have to actually be at a certain resonating at a certain vibration before that can happen. I don't think I did. I address your <laughs> comment. Oh, it's certainly a lot of interesting. Yeah. Comments. <laughs> There's a question from uh, Michelle Christie. Um, I don't know if you can see that, Maria or Desiree. It's to both of you. Guys. Is it in the chat? It's in the chat, and it's to both of you. How do you think this dark night is translated into our current time period? Hmm. Maria, you want to handle that one? <laughs> <laughs> Because I, yeah, go go ahead, please. Desi, I said no, but okay, I'll give it oh. a <laughs> I, I think it's, I think that um, Dark Night of the Soul, I guess, is that um, process in which we turn inward and we have to kind of like let go of what we think we are. And we are left without nothing in a way momentarily because then we realize or we find out that we are a soul and so we began our true search for that uh, way that will lead us to the path so i think is that transition you know when we look inward and um we kind of like get um we try to um uh, we have to leave what we think we are behind and then we don't have anything and we are kind of like in darkness. But um, that light be um, becomes evident within ourselves. That's when we realize that we are a soul. I don't know, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> I'd like, uh, so Michelle, tell me what you think. Tell us what you think. Let's see. Michelle, I don't know if you can uh, hear us or hit the computer. If not, it's okay. Michelle, are you there? Okay. Well. I suppose we all go through a dark night. Um, when I when I first, she's talking about a current time period, and I would assume that you can, because we do go through darkness and you know stages of um, renaissance, and sometimes they're they almost bleed into each other. So there there's no like set time when they start and set time when they begin and another or end and another one begins. So, um, oh, Michelle says she can't speak right now. Okay. 
So I think you can have this, um, the dark night. You know, I can also say that a person who is coming down off of an addiction also experiences a kind of dark night because at one point they are, they're experiencing life while they're on drugs at such a high pitch and they feel so alive that to bring them down, they go, go, they go through, you know, withdrawals. They go through a horrible dark night just to get back to a normal state. So there's all sorts of ways we can apply this dark night. But what he is talking about here is, um, is a completely spiritual experience and that the soul actually goes through a purgatory on purpose. <laughs> and it, it's forcing itself to basically eliminate everything that it has in the past been attached to and that it associates with life. And that might sound like an easy thing to do, but if you've ever taken that life away from someone, that energy, that um, stimulation, it leaves them in a place of complete, just, what did he, I wrote this down when I listened to five hours of John on the cross on the, <laughs> on the TV last night. It leaves them um, lost. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Sorry, guys. It loses ground because it loses perspective of what it's learned, what it has learned in the past and enjoy. And in fact, it actually loses at some point its ability to reflect back. And think of what that means when you cannot reflect back. It's almost like being um, a child whose parent has held you in their bosom and all of a sudden now is putting you on the ground and leaving you there to walk. And you're flailing around trying to figure out, you know, where is my parent? Um, what do I grab onto? I don't know what I'm doing. You know, you're in a place where you don't know um, what's coming next. And, but the parent does that on purpose. The parent source is basically like the, the parent who's putting the kid on one side of the room and saying, okay, now you walk to me, hands off. And there's a purpose behind that because just like the, the caterpillar in the, in the chrysalis, it has to struggle to get out. It can't metamorphosize until it does this. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you can kind of think of it in that way, it's a very natural process. There's nothing unusual about it. It's it's law. I mean, it really is boils down to universal law. But, yeah, the voice will be quiet. That that internal voice will be quiet for a while because you have to learn to walk. Even in darkness. Mm -hmm. But if you know you're walking in darkness and it's a natural process, then perhaps it would be, you know, like this, um, like John, St. John of the Cross, he can rest. His house is at rest. That's what he's referring to. I'm no longer vexed. I'm doing it alone. I'm doing it disguised. Nobody can see me, meaning his, his vexations are no longer there. They're asleep, and his house is at rest. I think PJ's uh, comment would fit in with that. Can you see that one? Um, it seems. I'm seeing a lot of them. Wait, wait, let me work the answer. This is wondering what you thought about more practical examples taking it out past time frame. VJ says. Oh, VJ, okay, okay. It seems in this life it's all about gaining and gaining knowledge where the dark. Okay, in this. Hey, okay, Desiree. Mm -hmm. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, hey, um, thank you. You answered that question really great. I, that's basically what I was thinking about with uh, different kinds of addiction, just practical examples of bringing it, taking it out of the medieval time frame and, and yeah. how it would, would be. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. But it does seem that this, uh, 
thing that but, Jay wrote is ties in with that. It seems Absolutely. That, it seems in this life, it's all about attaining and gaining knowledge where the dark night seems to be the alchemical key of letting go, turning inward and allowing the spirit to drive. You got it. I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's a pretty good. Um, I like that. I, I think St. John of the Cross would like that too. Thank you. <laughs> you think, uh, well, I don't know if anybody, uh, well, if I could ask a question also. Um, uh, nowadays, they talk about uh, a dual diagnosis where you could have an addiction but there would be a depression that parallels it or something. And they both kind of feed on each other or something like that. Yeah. Now, what about a vertical dual diagnosis? In other words, uh, psychological things going on that are rough in life, you know, that make you depressed or whatever, but also spiritual things going on at the same time. And one is, in other words, I think I've even seen that in some Jungian thought where people uh, where he points out that there's such a thing as um, a psychological depression, but behind it is a spiritual thing going on. Mm -hmm. I think so too, because, you know, we're not, we're not born into a clean slate. We, we bring you know, baggage with us from previous lives. So they could have been on a spiritual pursuit in a previous life and kind of left in that purgation process. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just guessing. I'm speculating here. Um, yeah, or, you know, they could have been in an addiction situation in the past or experienced PTSD in the past, you know, and then carrying that baggage with them. So it's kind of, um, yeah, what happens when you have all of that um, that baggage, how do you separate it out? And maybe that's why the individual, when they're on this path, has to kind of shed it. They have to sh do the shedding. Um, I kind of don't know how one would do that, but, you know, having to deal with so many vexations at once. Um, but yeah. And, and I, I, I was just thinking that the shoeless stage is also a symbolic thing of shedding uh, attachments, holding on to things. Right. So that's a beautiful way of looking at the shoeless descalcito mm -hmm. yes. um, stage too. Yeah. Absolutely. Could I ask a question of Maria or both of you? But um, Maria just read so beautifully that, first of all, mm -hmm. she analyzed it, helped us understand it, which made it all that much of a richer experience to hear it. And I wish we could have heard it all in Spanish. But um, what, where I'm going with this is that um, she read it <laughs> with such joy and beauty. And this is, uh, you know, the dark night of the soul and all this stuff. But Maria, see, you seem to get such ecstasy and such beauty um, in this, especially the way you re would read transcending all knowledge each time you kind of recited that. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that um, joy, unless it trans all, transcends all knowledge and then you can't tell us, but. <laughs> I think that um, I see it like, um, it's kind of like returning, like going back home. Mm. So. That's why I, I read I read it with joy because that's how I kind of like see it, you know, returning home. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's beautiful. Are there any other uh, comments or questions? If not, we can. Uh, we've got a lot to think about. Well, thank you both very, very much. And you guys complimented each other so well. And what a beautiful presentation. And